We'll be up there. I just forgot to put it on this screen. So 267. Do not mark your books at 480. <laughs> it is good to see everybody out with us this evening, especially if you're visiting. Thank you so much for being with us. We're excited to see you. We're happy to see you. We hope that you are encouraged and uplifted by the things that we'll have to discuss here in the sermon tonight. I've entitled the sermon tonight, The Biggest Little Word. And we're going to spend our time tonight over in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. Now, when we think about language generally, I think we all understand there are a lot of really little short words that possess a tremendous amount of meaning and significance. I'm not sure there is a word smaller and yet more filled with meaning in the Scripture than that little word, if. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11-13 through 13 says this, The saying is trustworthy. For if we have died with Him, we will also live with Him. If we endure, we will also reign with Him. If we deny Him, He also will deny us. If we are faithless, He remains faithful, for He cannot deny Himself. Four times... That little word, if, just two letters, is used in these verses, and yet, as we can see, and I hope will be made even more clear as we go throughout the sermon this evening, they are, or it is a giant word when it comes to its significance, when it comes to the meaning attached to it. Now, I suspect every Bible student in here has read through 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 through 13, many, many times. But when was the last time, as you read through it, you really kind of slowed down to consider the significance of what was being said there? That's what we want to do here this evening. And we're going to proceed learning from a very little word with giant significance. Verse 11 says this, If we have died with Him, we will also live with Him. Now when Bible students hear this idea of dying with Christ, there's a handful of passages that no doubt come to mind. Perhaps at the top of that list is Romans chapter 6. We talk a lot about baptism. What I'd like for us to do is just consider how significant it really is by considering what we read in Romans chapter 6. Go ahead and turn your Bibles there with me, if you will. And let's read the first 11 verses. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. This is what the passage says. What then, or what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? We were buried therefore with Him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So in these few verses alone, we're just being reminded here of the significance of that event, the significance of what occurs when we are washed, when we are immersed in water as we confess our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, it is there that we are dying to sin. It is there that we are rising to newness of life. And what exactly does all of that mean? Well, let's keep going. Verse 5, For if we have been united with Him in a death like His, we shall certainly be united with Him in a resurrection like His. 
We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. When we were baptized, we joined our Lord in His death. When we came up out of that water, we joined our Lord in His resurrection. We died to sin there. And we began the process of living for Christ there. If we have died with Him, we will also live with Him. Where does that begin to happen? That begins to happen right there at the waters of baptism. Now maybe somebody is saying, begin to happen. Why are you kind of putting it as though this was a continuing or is a continuing sort of process? Well, I'm saying it that way because in a very real sense, it is a continuing process. We must not view the death that occurred there at the waters of baptism as a one-time thing that has absolutely no real significance on the way that we live our lives going forward. Over in Romans chapter 8 and verse 13, we're told this, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Now let me ask you this. Have you seen in your life as a Christian that the passions of the flesh, the deeds of the body, are kind of in a constant effort to be resurrected in your life? That the adversary is doing what he can do to make you cross those bridges that we vowed to God we were burning? Rebuild them? Go back to those manners of life that we once lived? Absolutely. That's what Satan's trying to do. He's trying to get us back. And so when we talk about this idea of a continuing impact of the death that occurred there in our baptisms, I want you to look over at Colossians 3 with me. Colossians chapter 3, let's pick up in verse 5, and we'll take it through verse 11. Colossians 3, beginning in 5, taking it to verse 11. Paul says, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its Creator. And so you look at all of these sins that are being uh, set forth as part of that old life, the life that was supposed to have died when we became Christians. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, wrath, slander, obscene talk. You find times in your life when those things are desperately trying to be resurrected, desperately trying to come back into your life and play a significant role? Absolutely. We all experience that, and we all have that. But if we have died with Him, and we have if we have become Christians, we will also live with Him. That means our lives, after we become children of God, are no longer lived for self. We read that tonight in our Scripture reading. They're no longer lived for self. They're lived for the One who saved us. If we have died with Him, we will also live with Him. What a wonderful promise that is. But what a massive, massive word. If. He goes on in the second part, or rather the first part of verse 12. If we endure, we will also reign with Him. 
Now, if you wanted to, you could look back up there at chapter 2 and verse 10, and you'll see the word that's translated endure there is the same one that's translated such in this passage. And when we talk about enduring, what exactly are we talking about? Well, we're talking about bearing up, having our faith tested, having our faith assaulted and assailed from without, sometimes even from within, and yet bearing up in the face of those things with our faith intact. You know, you think about this. Just think about what we experience as we go throughout life. We've had in this congregation, we've had a lot of it in the last few years. We've had a lot of death. Death of members, death of family members who uh, their family are parts of this congregation. It's just something that, that we've experienced here an awful lot lately. And there are times when when a death can really hit someone very, very hard. And that's especially true in those times when it was unexpected. Not to say an expected death is easy. Of course not. But those times when it's an unexpected death, when it just sort of comes out of the blue, those are trials, aren't they? And they can, for a period of time, just put you down in a valley of darkness. And it can seem as though a cl- just a, a cloud is just, a dark rain cloud is just hovering over you for an extended period of time. You know what that does? That tests faith. And we go through those things. Sometimes it's not a death. Sometimes it could be a loss of a job. Sometimes it could be a frightening diagnosis could be any number of things. And of course, we have temptations facing us every day. When was the last day you didn't face a temptation to sin? When was the last day you had one of those? Let me ask you this. When was the last day you only faced ten temptations to sin in the day? We don't have many of those, do we? It seems to be hourly, multiple times an hour, doesn't it? We have opportunities opportunities to sin. Satan's going to see that those, those decisions are placed before us. And temptations, what do they do? Well, they measure our loyalty to God. How strong it is, or as the case may be, how weak it is. And of course, there are times when our faith is just going to be assaulted. It's going to be attacked. People are going to say really cruel things to us because of our faith. People are going to call us names and make fun of us and insult us because of our faith. And what's that going to do? Well, that's going to show us if we have the type of faith that endures or not. In other words, if our faith is real... Or if it's less than it ought to be. I want to consider a number of passages here uh, from Paul's letter to Timothy. Um, They're all of these verses. I'm going to separate them just by three dots so you'll know exactly where we are based upon that. But Paul started off and said this, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, His prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. There will be times where we have to decide, am I going to be ashamed of God? Am I going to be ashamed of what He said? Or am I going to be willing to hold to it, to bear up in the face of whatever I might have to face as a result of my loyalty to Him? Because Satan is going to make sure We're going to have plenty of times to be ashamed of it if that's going to be our choice. Paul said, don't do that. A little bit later there in chapter 1, he says, which is why I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed. And I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Move a little bit further there in chapter 1 to verse 15. You are aware that all who are in Asia turned away from me, among whom are Phagellus and Hermogenes. There was Paul, another instance where he was abandoned. You think that didn't hurt? You think that wasn't a trial for him? Would it be a trial for us? 
would be for me. I'm sure it was for him as well. Chapter 3 and verse 12 says, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And over in the first two verses of chapter 4, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by His appearing and His kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. I don't know if you've ever really noticed this before, but when you consider that be ready in season and out of season, and then what he says next, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience indicates that most of the time it's going to be out of season. That's why reproving, rebuking, and exhorting with patience is going to be required. Most of the time, God's Word is out of season, meaning people don't really want to hear it, don't really want to accept it and embrace everything that it contains. And yet that's what we're called upon to do. If we endure, we will also reign with Him. Now that's an awesome thought isn't it? That's an extraordinary thought. And the blessing of reigning with Christ is simply that we are heirs. That's what we are. We are fellow heirs with our Lord. Because our God is King, being sons and daughters of the King means we're royalty, doesn't it? That's really an incredible thought. There's a lot of passages that mention this uh, in various ways. I want us just to look at two of them from Revelation. Revelation 3, verse 21 says this, The one who conquers, I will grant him, now listen to this, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, the very throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Chapter 5 and verse 10. And you have made them, Christian saints, you have made them a kingdom. And priests, Peter calls us a royal priesthood. There's that idea of royal again. Priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Now there's a lot of obvious questions that come to mind when we see this idea of reigning. Primarily, what exactly does it mean that we're going to reign? I hope you don't expect me to answer that. (laughs) I do want to say this. The blessing of it is to be found in the intimate unity between Christ and His people. Whatever it means that we will be reigning with Him, it will be a result of what He is. A result of what He has done. He has conquered. He has won the victory, and He will grant His people to share with Him in some way in that reign. But what is it going to require? It's going to require that we endure, that we bear up in this life with our faith and our trust and our love intact. So let's make sure that we are doing it. Again, it's a wonderful promise with a massive little word at the beginning, if. Now the next two, there are two positive statements here and two not quite as positive. They begin now. The third point that Paul makes there in the second part of verse 12 is this, if we deny Him, He also will deny us. Now here's a really interesting thing that If you read the passage and you notice the words that are being used, what I find very interesting is that to deny Him is set as the opposite of enduring. Now, to deny Christ does not necessarily mean that we have to come right out and announce to the world, I deny Christ. That's not necessarily what this means. There's a statement made by the Apostle Paul over in Titus chapter 1 and verse 16, and I would suggest 
Denying Christ happens far more often, or at least as often, in this way as it does someone actually coming out and saying the words. This is what Paul said. He's talking about a certain group of individuals there. They profess to know God. Now hear this. But they deny Him by their works. They profess to know Him. But it's their actions that demonstrate they are denying Him. Go back to a point that we made just a few moments ago. How many times throughout your day do you find yourself confronted with a choice, with a decision? I can proceed now based upon what I know God's will is, based upon what He said, or, or principles that He has put forth. I can do that. Or I could choose the other path. And I could do it a different way. And when we have that internal monologue and we're, we're going through that internal thought process and we're getting close to making a decision, here's what I hope that we understand. Every single time we face that fork in the road, and we see the sign over here that says God's way. We see the sign over here that says my way or anyone else's way, and we choose that second path. We have denied Him by our works. Every single time. Now that doesn't mean that we are committing ourselves at that point to living a life that is characterized by denying our Lord. Doesn't mean that at all. We can repent of those choices and we can uh, resolve to do better and to fulfill our vows and do what we're supposed to do. And we ought to all be doing that when we sin. And I... Doubt there's an individual in here who would say, I never sin. <laughs> and so when those times come and we do deny Him through our actions, we repent and resolve to do better, right? But you think how many times that can happen during a day. You think how many times during a day we can make the wrong choice. I remember years ago, a... Uh, murderer, a serial killer, was, was being interviewed from prison. He talked about the lives that he had taken. And I remember him saying the first time was the hardest. And after that, it got easier and easier and easier until at the end, he wasn't even thinking about it anymore. Anything can become like that, can it? Any wrong action if it's permitted to go on long enough without any stop, gets easier. And eventually it can even become sort of second nature. Now that's something we certainly don't want to happen. He says if we deny Him, He also will deny us. What is He really saying? He's saying, I'm going to do whatever you choose to do to me. That's what He's saying here. Whatever your choice is, however you choose to treat me, I'm going to go ahead and treat you. You know, there's a, an, interesting, an interesting couple of verses from the NIV. I, I really like the way the NIV translates these two passages because I think they actually ramp up the verbiage. I think the words used make it even stronger when we consider this. The verse we're looking at here in verse 12, and the NIV is translated this way, if we disown Him. That's some strong language, isn't it? If we disown Him, He will also disown us. And Matthew 10.33 has the same thing. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. Now we sing a song, I'm not ashamed to own my Lord, nor defend His cause. Right? We sing that often. But here's the thing. When those times come and we're actually called upon to put up, or as the expression is, shut up, and we're called upon to do it or not do it, do we actually defend His cause? That's what we say we're going to do, and we say we're not ashamed to do it. But if the time comes, and I look at the situation, 
And I say, you know what? <laughs> no, <laughs> that there could be some repercussions here. I mean, immediate repercussions for me to, to own his cause here, to defend it. So no, in this, in this particular situation, no, I'm not going to own my Lord. He says, fine, you can do that. That's your choice, and it's a choice you are permitted. But know this, I will treat you how you treat me. That's what he's saying. Are you ashamed to own me? Will you disown me? Okay, and I'll disown you. If we deny him, he also will deny us. There it is again, a giant little word at the beginning of this statement. And finally, if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Brethren, I want to read to you, and I typically don't do this, but I think in this particular instance it might be a good, a good thing to do. Interestingly enough, this is from the very Bible, the NIV, that I use to get the last two verses. If we disown Him, He also will disown us. And then we come to the comments on verse 13, and this is what they are. Jesus is faithful. True. He will stay by our side even when we have endured so much that we seem to have no faith left. That has nothing to do with what verse 13 is saying. We may be faithless at times, but Jesus is faithful to His promise to be with us to the very end of the age. Refusing Christ's help will break our communication with God but He will never turn His back on us, even though we may turn our backs on Him. If you disown me, I will disown you. What does that mean? I'll tell you what it means. Nothing. If that explanation of verse 13 is true, it means nothing. But I'll tell you this, it means a great deal. And this is what it means. Whether we are faithful or not, Jesus always is. Our Lord is going to do precisely what our Lord promised He would do. He will remain true to the divine nature, to His divine character all the time and in all ways. Practically speaking, what does this mean? It means our Lord will carry out His threats. It means He doesn't just say things to say them. He will carry out His threats. Yes, He will carry out His promises. We love to embrace those, and we should embrace those, but... It's not just the good things He will do. If He has said, I will act against you if you act against me, He will act against us. That's what the passage is saying. Matthew 10, 32 and 33, this is from the English Standard Version this time, which is what I use. So everyone who acknowledges me before men I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. In the language of the NIV, you could say anyone who owns me before my Father or before men, I will own before my Father. That is wonderful. It's an extraordinary blessing. It's a blessing that's filled with grace, filled with, with gifts that we don't deserve. But, beloved, we don't have to own Him, do we? We don't have to do that. We can be ashamed of Him. We can refuse to acknowledge Him. We can disown Him. And if we do, well, there's a promise about that as well. But whoever denies me before men, 
I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. Mark it down. Take it to the bank. It's a promise from the mouth of God. And God cannot lie. So, the call for us is very sober reflection, isn't it? The call is for you and I to take a good, hard look at our lives. Consider the manner of it. Consider what we're doing. Consider what the Lord has said in these passages. And let's make sure our lives reflect what we see in the first two promises. Because if they do, He will own us, acknowledge us, confess us before His Father. And there is nothing more wonderful than that. But if we don't, if we choose to be faithless, if we were to say, Lord, I don't believe you're going to keep your promises, well, He will be faithful because He can't deny Himself. He's going to do precisely what He said that He would do. And let's make sure that means for us salvation. Heaven, because it doesn't have to mean that. We may have some here tonight who are not Christians, and if that's the case, you have the opportunity now to render your obedience to Christ. I pray that you would, if you truly believe that He is the Christ, the Son of God. Repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him as Lord, and be baptized to have your sins washed clean from your soul. All things are ready question is, are you? And if the answer is yes, we invite you to come forward now as together we stand and sing.